Metamorphosis by Ovid. Translated by Sir Samuel Garth, John Dryden, et al. Book the Fifth. The story of Perseus continued. While Perseus entertained with this report, his father Cepheus and the listening court, within the palace walls was heard aloud the roaring noise of some unruly crowd. Not like the songs which cheerful friends prepare for nuptial days, but sounds that threatened war, and all the pleasures of this happy feast, to tumult turned, in wild disorder ceased. So, when the sea is calm, we often find a storm raised sudden by some furious wind. Chief in the riot, Phineas first appeared, the rash ringleader of this boisterous herd, and brandishing his brazen-pointed lance, behold, he said, an injured man advance. Stung with resentment for his ravished wife, nor shall thy wings, O Perseus, save thy life, nor Jove himself, though we've been often told, who got thee in the form of tempting gold. His lance was aimed when Cepheus ran and said, Hold, brother, hold, what brutal rage has made your frantic mind so black a crime conceive? And these the thanks that you to Perseus give? This the reward that to his worth you pay, whose timely valor saved Andromeda? Nor was it he, if you would reason right, that forced her from you, but the jealous spite of envious nereids and Jove's high decree, and that devouring monster of the sea, that ready with his jaws wide gaping stood to eat my child, the fairest of my blood. You lost her then, when she seemed past relief, and wished perhaps her death to ease your grief. With my afflictions not content to view Andromeda in chains unhelped by you, her spouse and uncle, Will you grieve that he exposed his life the dying maid to free? And shall you claim his merit? Had you thought her charm so great, you should have bravely sought that blessing on the rocks. There fix she lay, but now let Perseus bear his prize away. By service gained, by promise faith possessed, to him I owe that my age is blessed still with a child. Nor think that I prefer Perseus to thee, but to the loss of her. Phineas on him, and Perseus rolled about, his eyes in silent rage, and seemed to doubt which to destroy, till, resolute at length, he threw his spear with the redoubled strength his fury gave him, and at Perseus struck, but missing Perseus, in his seat it stuck, who, springing nimbly up, returned the dart, and almost plunged it in his rival's heart. But he for safety to the altar ran, unfit protection for so vile a man. Yet was the stroke not vain, as Rita's found, who in his brow received a mortal wound. Headlong he tumbled when his skull was broke, from which his friends the fatal weapon took, while he lay trembling and his gushing blood in crimson streams around the table flowed. But this provoked the unruly rabble worse. They flung their darts and some in loud discourse to death young Perseus and the monarch doom. But Cepheus left before the guilty room with grief appealing to the gods above who laws of hospitality approve, who faith protect and succor injured right, that he was guiltless of this barbarous fight. Pallas, her brother Perseus, close attends, and with her ample shield, from harm defends. Raising a sprightly courage in his heart, but Indian Athos took the weaker part, born in the crystal grottoes of the sea, limnet son of Feni, nymph, and she, daughter of Ganges, graceful was his mane, his person lovely, and his age sixteen. His habit made his native beauty more, a purple mantle fringed with gold he wore. His neck well turned with golden chains was graced, his hair with myrrh perfumed was nicely dressed. Though with just aim he could the javelin throw, yet with more skill he drew the bending bow, and now was drawing it with artful hand, when Perseus, snatching up a flaming brand, whirred suddenly at his face the burning wood crushed his eyes in and quenched the fire with blood. Through the soft skin the splintered bones appear and spoiled the face that lately was so fair. When Lycabus, 
his Athis thus beheld, how was his heart with friendly horror filled? A youth so noble, to his soul so dear, to see his shapeless look, his dying groans to hear, he snatched the bow the boy was used to bend, and cried, with me, false traitor, dare contend, boast not a conquest over a child, but try thy strength with me, who all thy powers defy, nor think so mean an act of victory, while yet he spoke, he flung the whizzing dart, which pierced the plated robe, but missed his heart. Perseus defied upon him, fiercely pressed, with sword unsheathed, and plunged it in his breast. His eyes overwhelmed with night, he stumbling falls, and with his latest breath, Anathus calls, pleased that so near the lovely youth he lies, he sinks his head upon his friend, and dies. Next, Eager Forbus, old Methian son, came rushing forward with Amphimedon. When the smooth pavement, slippery made with gore, tripped up their feet and flung them on the floor, the sword of Perseus, who by chance was nigh, prevents their rise, and where they fall, they lie. Full in his ribs, Amphimedon he smote, and then struck fiery Forbus in the throat. Eurythus lifting up his axe, the blow was thus prevented by his nimble foe. A golden cup he seizes, high embossed, and at his head the massy goblet tossed. It hits, and from his forehead bruised rebounds, and blood and brains he vomits from his wounds. With his slain fellows on the floor he lies, and death forever shuts his swimming eyes. Then Polydamon fell, a goddess born, Phlegius and Elsian with locks unshorn. Next followed. Next, the stroke of death he gave to Clytus, Abinus, and Lysitus, brave, while over unnumbered heaps of ghastly dead the archive hero's feet triumphant tread. But Phineas stands aloof and dreads to feel his rival's force and flies his pointed steel. Yet through a dart from far by chance it lights on Idas, who for neither party fights, but wounded sternly thus, to Phineas said, Since of a neuter thou a foe hast made, this I return thee, drawing from his side the dart, which, as he strove to fling, he died. Odities fell by Clamineus's sword, the Sethan court had not a greater lord, Hypsius his blade does in protenor sheath, but brave Lincides soon revenged his death. Here too was old Amathion, one that feared the gods, and in the cause of heaven appeared, who only wishing the success of right and by his age exempted from the fight, both sides like condemns this impious war. Cease, cease, he cries, these bloody broils forbear this scarce the sage with high concern had said when Chromis at a blow struck off his head which dropping on the royal altar rolled still staring at the crowd with aspect bold and still it seemed their horrid strive to blame in life and death his pious zeal the same while clinging to the thorns the trunk expires the severed head consumes amidst the fires then Phineas, who from far his javelin threw, Brodius and Amon, twins and brothers slew, for not at gauntlets matchless in the field, but gauntlets must to swords and javelins yield. Ampicus next, with hollowed fillets bound, as Ceres's priest, and with a mitre crowned, his spear transfixed and struck him to the ground. O oh, Iapetides, with pain I tell how you, sweet lyrist, in the riot fell. What worse than brutal rage his breast could fill? Who did thy blood, O oh bard celestial, spill? Kindly you pressed amid the princely throng to crown the feast and give the nuptial song. Discord abhorred the music of thy lyre, whose notes did gentle peace so well inspire. Thee, when fierce Pedalus far off espied, defenseless with thy heart, he, scoffing, cried, Go to the ghost, thy soothing lessons play. We loathe thy lyre and scorn thy peaceful lay. And as again he fiercely bid him go, he pierced his temples with a mortal blow. His harp he held, though sinking on the ground, whose strings in death his trembling fingers found, by chance, and tuned by chance, a dying sound. 
with grief. Like Cormus saw him fall from far, and resting from the door a massy bar, full in his pole, lays on a load of knocks, which stun him, and he falls like a devoted ox. Another bar Pelites would have snatched, but Corinthus his motion slyly watched. He darts his weapon from a private stand and rivets to the post his veiny hand when straight a missive spear transfixed his side by a bas throne, and as he hung, he died. Millenius on the prince's side was slain, and Dorlis, who owned a fertile plain of Nazimonius' fields, the wealthy lord, whose crowded barns could scarce contain their board, a whizzing spear obliquely gave a blow, struck him in his groin, and pierced the nerves below. His foe beheld his eyes' convulsive roll, his ebbing veins and his departing soul. Then Taunting said, Of all thy spacious plain, this spot thy only property remains. He left him thus, but had no sooner left than Perseus in revenge his nostrils cleft. From his friend's breast the murdering dart he threw, and the same weapon at the murderer threw. His head in halves the darted javelin cut, and on each side the brain came issuing out. Fortune, his friend, in deaths around he deals, and this is Lance, and that, and that, his fortune feels. Now Claudius dies, and by a different wound, the twin, his brother Clanus, bites the ground. In his rent jaw the bearded weapon sticks, and the steel dart does Claudius' thigh transfix. With these Mendesian Celadon he slew, and Astrius next, whose mother was a Jew, his sire uncertain. Then by Perseus fell, Athean, who could things to come foretell, but now he knows not whence the javelin flies, that wounds his breast, nor by whose arm he dies. The squire to Phineas next his valor tried, and fierce agurities stained with parricide. As these were slain, fresh numbers still appear and wage with Perseus an unequal war, to rob him of his right, the maid he won, by honor, promise, and desert his own. With him, the father of the beauteous bride, the mother and the frighted virgin sigh. With shrieks and doleful cries they rend the air, their shrieks confounded with the din of war, with dashing arms and groanings of the slain. They grieve, unpitied, and unheard complain. The floor with bloody streams, Bologna stains, and Phineas a new war with double rage maintains. Perseus begirt from all around they pour, their lances on him, a tempestuous shower, aimed all at him, a cloud of darts and spears, or blind his eyes, or whistle round his ears, their numbers to resist against the wall, he guards his back secure and dares them all. Here from the left Mulpius renews the fight, and bold Ethamon presses on the right, as when a hungry tiger near him hears, two lowing herds a while he both forbears, nor can his hopes of this or that renounce, so strong he lusts to prey on both at once. Thus Perseus now with that or this is loth to war distinct, but fain would fall on both. And first Chinoin Mulpius felt his blow and fled, and never after faced his foe. Then fierce Ethamon, as he turned his back, hurried with fury, aiming at his neck. His brandished sword against the marble struck with all his might. The brittle weapon broke, and in his throat the point rebounding stuck. Too slight for the wound for life to issue thence, and yet too great for battle or defense. His arms extended in this piteous state. For mercy he would sue, but sues too late. Perseus has in his bosom plunged the sword, and ere he speaks, the wound prevents the word. The crowds increasing and his friends distressed, himself by warring multitudes oppressed. Since thus unequally you fight this time, he cried, to punish your presumptuous crime. Beware, my friends, his friends were soon prepared. Their sight averting high the head he reared, and Gorgon on his foes severely stared. Vain shift! said Theseus with aspect bold. Thee and thy bugbear monster I behold with scorn. He lifts his arm, but ere he threw the dart, the hero to a statue grew 
in the same posture, still the marble stands and holds the warrior's weapons in its hands. Amphix, whom yet this wonder can't alarm, heaves at Lincides' breast his impious arm, but while thus daringly he presses on, his weapon and his arm are turned to stone. Next, Nileus, who vainly said he owed his origin to Nile's prolific flood, who on his shield seven silver rivers bore, his birth to witness by the arms he wore, full on his sevenfold father thus expressed, his boast to Perseus and his pride confessed. See whence we sprung, let this thy comfort be in thy sure death, that thou didst die by me. While yet he spoke, the dying accents hung in sounds imperfect on his marble tongue. Though changed to stone, his lips seemed to stretch, and through the insensate rock would force a speech. This Eric saw, but seeing would not own, the mischief by yourselves, he cries, is done. Tis your cold courage turns your hearts to stone. Come, follow me, fall on the stripling boy, kill him, and you his magic arms destroy. Then rushing on, his arm to strike he reared, and marbled over his varied frame appeared. These for a fronting palace were chastised and justly met the death they had despised. But brave Acontius, Perseus's friend by chance, looked back and met the Gorgon's fatal glance. A statue now become, he ghastly stares, and still the foe to mortal combat dares. Astyages, the living likeness, knew. On the dead stone, with vengeful fury flew. But impotent his rage, the jarring blade no print upon the solid marble made. Again, as with redoubled might be struck, himself astonished in the quarry stuck. The vulgar deaths twere tedious to rehearse, and fates below the dignity of verse. Their safety in their flight two hundred found, two hundred by Medusa's head were stoned. Fierce Phineas now repents the wrongful fight, and views his varied friends a dreadful sight. He knows their faces, for their help he sues, and thinks, not hearing him, that they refuse. By name he begs their succor one by one, then doubts their life, and feels the friendly stone struck with remorse, and conscious of his pride. Convict of sin, he turned his eyes aside with suppliant mane to Perseus. Thus he prays, hence with the head, as far as wind and seas. Can... Bear thee hence, O quit the Cephan shore, and never curse us with Medusa more, that horrid head which stiffens into stone, those impious men who daring death look on. I ward not with thee out of hate or strife, but honest cause was to defend my wife, first pledged to me. What crime could I suppose to arm my friends and vindicate my spouse? But vain too late, I see, was our design. Mine was the title, but the merit thine. Contending made me guilty, I confess. But penitence should make that guilt the less. T'was thine to conquer my Minerva's power. Favored of heaven, thy mercy I implore. For life I sue, the rest to thee I yield. In pity, from my sight, remove the shield. He suing said, nor durst revert his eyes on the grim head. And Perseus thus replies, Coward! What is in me to grant I will, nor blood unworthy of my valor spill? Fear not to perish by my vengeful sword. From that secure, tis all the fates afford. Where I now see thee, thou shalt still be seen, a lasting monument to please our queen. There still shall thy betrothed behold her spouse, and find his image in her father's house. This said, where Phineas turned to shun the shield, full in his face the staring head he held. As here and there he strove to turn aside, the wonder wrought the man was petrified. All marble was his frame, his humid eyes dropped tears, which hung upon the stone like ice, in suppliant posture with uplifted hands and fearful look, the guilty statue stands. Hence Perseus to his native city highs, victorious and rewarded with his prize. Conquest over Pradius the usurper won, he reinstates his grandsire in the throne. Pradius, his brother dispossessed by might, his realm enjoyed and still detained his right. But Perseus pulled the haughty tyrant down, and to the rightful king restored the throne. Weak was the usurper, as his cause was wrong. 
when Gorgon's head appears, what arms are strong? When Perseus to his host had monster held, they soon were statues and their king expelled. Thence, to Seraphus with the head he sails, whose prince his story treats as idle tales. Lord of a little isle, he scorns to seem too credulous, but laughs at that and him. Yet did he not so much suspect the truth as that of pride or envy, hate the youth. The Argive prince at his contempt enraged, to force his faith by fatal proof engaged. Friends, shut your eyes, he cries, his shield he takes, and to the king expose Medusa's snakes. The monarch felt the power he would not own, and stood convict of folly in the stone. Minerva's interview with the muses. Thus far, Minerva was content to rove with Perseus, offspring of her father Jove. Now, hid in clouds, Seraphis she forsook, and to the Theban towers her journey took. Sithnos and Gyros lying to her right, she passed unheeded in her eager flight, and choosing first on Helicon to rest, the virgin muses in these words addressed. Me, the strange tidings of a new-found spring, ye learned sisters to this mountain bring. If all be true that fame's wide rumors tell, t'was Pegasus discovered first your well, whose piercing hoof gave the soft earth a blow, which broke the surface with these waters flow. I saw that horse by miracle obtain life from the blood of dire Medusa slain, and now this equal prodigy to view, from distant isles to famed Boeotia flew. The muse Urania said, Whatever cause so great a goddess to this mansion draws, Our shades are happy with so bright a guest. You, queen, are welcome, and we, muses, blessed. What fame has published of our spring is true. Thanks for our spring to Pegasus are due. Then, with becoming courtesy, she led the curious stranger to their fountain's head, Who long surveyed with wonder and delight the sacred water charming to the sight. Their ancient groves, dark grottos, shady bowers, and smiling plains adorned with various flowers. Oh, happy muses, she with rapture cried, who safe from cares on this fair hill reside. Blessed in your seat, and free yourselves to please with joys of study and with glorious ease. The Fate of Perennius. Then one replies, O oh, goddess, fit to guide our humble works and in our choir preside. Who, sure, would wisely to these fields repair to taste our pleasures and our labors share? Were not your virtue and superior mind to higher arts and nobler deeds inclined? Justly you praise our works and pleasing sit, which all might envy in this soft retreat, were we secured from dangers and from harms. But maids are frightened with the least alarms and none are safe, in this licentious time. Still, fierce Perennius and his daring crime with lasting horror strikes my feeble sight. Nor is my mind recovered from the fright with Thracian arms this bold usurper gained, Dalius and Phocus, where he proudly reigned. It happened once, as through his lands we went, for the bright temple of Parnassus bent. He met us there, and in his artful mind, hiding the faithless action he designed, conferred upon us, whom oh too well he knew, all honors that to goddesses are due. Stop, stop, ye muses. Tis your friend who calls, the tyrant said. Behold the rain that falls on every side, and that ill-boding sky whose lowering face portends more storms are nigh. Pray, make my house your own, and void of fear. While this bad weather lasts, take shelter here. Gods have made meaner places their resort, and for a cottage left their shining court. Obliged to stop by the united force of pouring rain and complacent discourse, his courteous invitation we obey, and in his hall resolve a while to stay. Soon it cleared up. The clouds began to fly, the driving north refined the showering sky. Then, to pursue our journey, we began, 
but the false traitor to his portal ran, stopped our escape, the door securely barred, and to our honor violence prepared, but we, transformed to birds, avoid his snare on pinions rising in the yielding air. But he, by lust and indignations fired, up to his highest tower with speed retired, and cries, in vain you from my arms withdrew, the way you go your lover will pursue, then in a flying posture, wildly placed, and daring from that height himself to cast, the wretch fell headlong, and the ground bestrewed with broken bones and stains of guilty blood. The story of Pierides. The muse yet spoke when they began to hear a noise of wings that fluttered in the air and straight a voice from some high spreading bough seemed to salute the company below. The goddess wondered and inquired from whence that tongue was heard that spoke so plainly since. It seemed to her a human voice to be, but proved a bird's, for in a shady tree nine magpies perched lament their altered state, and what they hear are skillful to repeat. The sister to the wandering goddess said, These foiled by us, by us were thus repaid. These did Evip of Paeonia bring, with nine hard labor pangs, to Pella's king, the foolish virgins of their number proud, and puffed with praises of the senseless crowd. Through all Achaea and the Ammonian plains defied us thus to match their artless strains. No more, ye thespian girls, your notes repeat, nor with false harmony the vulgar cheat, in voice or skill, if you with us will vie. As many we in voice or skill will try, surrender you to us if we excel, famed Aganip and Medusa's well. The conquest yours, your prize from us shall be, the Amathian plains to snowy Peony. The nymphs are judges. To dispute the field we thought a shame, but greater shame to yield. On seats of living stone the sisters sit, and by the river swear to judge aright. The Song of Pierides. Then rises one of the presumptuous throng, steps rudely forth, and first begins the song. With vain address describes the giant's wars, and to the gods their fabled acts prefers. She sings from earth's dark womb how Typhon rose, and struck with mortal fear his heavenly foes, how the gods fled to Egypt's slimy soil and hid their heads beneath the banks of Nile, how Typhon from the conquered skies pursued their routed godheads to the seven-mouthed flood, forced every god his fury to escape, some beastly form to take or earthly shape. Jove, so she sung, was changed into a ram from whence the horns of Libyan Anon came. Bacchus a goat, Apollo was a crow, Phoebe a cat, die wife of Jove, a cow, whose hue was whiter than the falling snow, Mercury to a nasty ibis turned, the change obscene, afraid of Typhon mourned, while Venus from a fish protection craves, and once more plunges in her native waves. She sung, and to her harp her voice applied, then us again to match her they defied. But our poor song, perhaps, for you to hear, nor leisure serves, nor is it worth your ear, that cause doubtless remove, O oh, muse, rehearse, the goddess cried, your ever grateful verse. Beneath the checkered shade, she takes her seat and bids her sister her whole song repeat. The sister thus, Calliope, we choose for the performance. The sweet virgin rose, with ivy crowned, she tunes her golden strings, and to her harp this composition sings. The Song of the Muses First, Sarah's taught the laboring hind to plow the pregnant earth and quickening seed to sow. She first for man did wholesome food provide, and with just laws the wicked world supplied, all good from her derived, to her belonged the grateful tributes of the muses' song. Her more worthy of our verse we deem, oh, were our verse more worthy of the theme. Jove, on the giant fair, Trinacria hurled, and with one bolt revenged his starry world. Beneath her burning hills, Typhus lies, and struggling always strives in vain to rise. Down does Pelorus his right hand suppress. Toward Latium, on the left, Pakin weighs. His legs are under lily bone spread, 
and Etna presses hard his horrid head. On his broad back he there extended lies, and vomits clouds of ashes to the skies. Oft laboring with his load, at last he tries and spews out in revenge a flood of fires. Mountains he struggles to overwhelm, and towns, earth's inmost bowels quake, and nature groans. His terrors reach the direful king of hell. He fears his throes will to the day reveal the realms of night and fright his trembling ghosts. This to prevent, he quits the Stygian coasts. In his black car, by sooty horses drawn, fair Sicily he seeks and dreads the dawn. Around her plains he casts his eager eyes, and every mountain to the bottom tries. But when in all the careful search he saw no cause of fear, no ill-suspected flaw, secure from harm, and wandering on at will, Venus beheld him from her flowery hill. When straight the dame her little cupid pressed with secret rapture to her snowy breast, and in these words the fluttering boy addressed, O thou, my arms, my glory, and my power, my son, whom men and deathless gods adore, bend thy sure bow whose arrows never missed, no longer let hell's king thy sway resist, take him while straggling from his dark abodes, he coasts the kingdoms of superior gods. If sovereign Jove, if gods who rule the waves, and Neptune who rules them, have been thy slaves, shall hell be free? The tyrant strike, my son, enlarge thy mother's empire and thy own. Let not our heaven be made the mock of hell, but Pluto to confess thy power, compel. Our rule is slighted in our native skies. See Pallas, see Diana, too defies thy darts, which Ceres's daughter would despise. She, too, our empire treats with awkward scorn. Such insolence no longer's to be borne. Revenge our slighted reign, and with thy dart transfix the virgins to the uncle's heart, she said. And from his quiver straight he drew a dart that surely would the business do. She guides his hand. She makes her touch the test. And of a thousand arrows, chose the best. No feather better poised, a sharper head none had. And sooner none and surer sped. He bends his bow. He draws it to his ear. Through Pluto's heart it drives and fixes there. The Rape of Proserpine. Near Enna's walls a spacious lake is spread, famed for the sweetly singing swans it bred. Pergasa is its name, and never more were heard, or sweeter, uncased or shore. Woods crown the lake, and Phoebus never invades the tufted fences or offends the shades. Fresh, fragrant breezes fan the verdant bowers. And the moist ground smiles with enameled flowers. The cheerful birds their airy carols sing. And the whole year is one eternal spring. Here, while young Proserpine among the maids diverts herself in these delicious shades. While like a child with busy speed and care, she gathers lilies here and violets there. While first to fill her little lap she strives, Hell's grisly monarch on the shade arrives, Sees her thus sporting on the flowery green, And loves the blooming maid as soon as seen, His urgent flame impatient of delay, Swift as his thought he sees the beauteous prey, And bore her in his sooty car away. The frighted goddess to her mother cries, But all in vain, for now, far off she flies. Far she behind her leaves her virgin train. To them too cries, and cries to them in vain. And while with passion she repeats her call, The violets from her lap and lilies fall. She misses them, poor heart, and makes new moan. Her lilies, ah, are lost, her violets gone. Over hills the ravisher and valleys speeds. By name encouraging his foamy steeds, he rattles o'er their necks the rusty reins, and ruffles with the stroke their shaggy manes. O'er lakes he whirls his flying wheels and comes to the palace breathing sulphur's fumes, and thence to where the Bacchiots of renown between unequal havens build their town. 
where Arethusa, round the imprisoned sea, extends her crooked coast to Sione, the nymph who gave the neighboring lake a name of all Sicilian nymphs the first in fame. She from the waves advanced her beauteous head, the goddess knew, and thus to Pluto said, Father, thou shalt not with the virgin run. Ceres is unwilling, canst thou be her son? The maid should be by sweet persuasion won. For suits not with the softness of the fair, for if great things with small I may compare, me, Anipis once loved, a milder course he took, and won me by his words, not force. Then, stretching out her arms, she stopped his way, but he, impatient of the shortest stay, throws to his dreadful steeds the slackened rein, and strikes his iron scepter through the mane. And depths profound through yielding waves he cleaves, and to hell's center a free passage leaves. Down sinks his chariot and his realms of night. The god soon reaches with a rapid flight. Siane dissolves to a fountain, but still does Siane the rape bemoan, and with the goddess's wrongs laments her own. For the stolen maid, and for her injured spring, time to her trouble no relief can bring. In her sad heart a heavy load she bears, till the dumb sorrow turns her all to tears, her mingling waters with that fountain pass, of which she late immortal goddess was. Her varied members to a fluid melt, a pliant softness in her bones is felt. Her wavy locks first drop away in dew, and liquid next, her slender fingers grew. The body's change soon seizes its extreme. Her legs dissolve, and feet flow off in stream. Her arms, her back, her shoulders, and her side, her swelling breasts in little currents glide. A silver liquor only now remains within the channel of her purple veins, nothing to fill love's grasp. Her husband chaste bathes in that bosom he before embraced. A boy transformed to an eft. Thus, while through all the earth and all the main, her daughter, mournful Ceres, sought in vain. Aurora, when with dewy looks she rose, nor burnished Vesper found her in repose. At Etna's flaming mouth, two pitchy pines, to light her in her search at length she tines. Restless with these, through frosty night she goes, nor fears the cutting winds, nor heeds the snows, and when the morning star the day renews, from east to west, her absent child pursues. Thirsty at last, by long fatigue she grows, but meets no spring, no rivulet, near her flows. Then, looking around, a lonely cottage spies, smoking among the trees and thither highs. The goddess knocking at the little door, t'was opened by a woman old and poor, who, when she begged for water, gave her ale, brewed long but well preserved from being stale. The goddess drank, a chuffy lad was by, who saw the liquor with a grutching eye, and grinning cries, she's greedy more than dry. Sarah's offended at his foul grimace, flung what she had not drunk into his face, and sprinkling speckle where they hit the skin, and a long tail does his body spin. His arms are turned to legs, and lest his size should make him mischievous, and he might rise against mankind, diminutives his frame. Less than a lizard, but in shape the same, amazed the dame the wondrous sight beheld, and weeps and fain would touch her quondam child. Yet her approach the affrighted vermin shuns, and fast into the greatest crevice runs, a name they gave him which the spots expressed, that rose like stars and varied all his breast. What lands, what seas the goddess wandered o'er, were long to tell, for there remained no more. Searching all around her fruitless toil she mourns, and with regret to Sicily returns. At length, where saying now flows, she came. Who could have told her, were she still the same, as when she saw her daughter sink to hell? But what she knows, she wants a tongue to tell. 
yet this plain signal manifestly gave the virgin's girdle floating on a wave, as late she dropped it from her slender waist, when with her uncle through the deep she passed. Sarah's the token by her grief confessed, and tore her golden hair and beat her breast. She knows not on what land her curse should fall, but as ingrate alike abrades them all, unworthy of her gifts. Denacria most, where the last step she found of what she lost. The plough for this the vengeful goddess broke, and with one death the ox and owner struck. In vain the fallow fields, the peasant tills, the seed corrupted air, tis sown. She kills the fruitful soil that once such harvest bore, now mocks the farmer's care, and teems no more. And the rich grain which fills the furrowed glade rots in the seed or shrivels in the blade, or too much sun burns up, or too much rain drowns, or black blights destroyed the blasted plain, or greedy birds the new sown seed devour, or darnel thistles and a crop impure of knotted grass along the acre stand, and spread their thriving roots through all the land. Then from the wave soft Arethusa rears her head, and back she flings her dropping hairs. O oh, mother of the maid, whom thou so far hast sought, of whom thou canst no tidings hear, O oh, thou, she cried, who art to life a friend, cease here thy search, and let thy labor in. Thy faithful Sicily is a guiltless clime, and should not suffer for another's crime. She neither knew nor could prevent the deed, nor think that for my country thus I plead. My country's Pisa, I'm an alien here, yet these abodes to Ellis I prefer. No clime to me so sweet, no place so dear, these springs I, Arethusa, now possess. And this my seat, O gracious goddess, bless, this island, why I love and why I crossed such spacious seas to reach Ortigia's coast. To you I shall impart, when void of care, your heart's at ease, and you're more fit to hear. When on your brow no pressing sorrow sits, for gay content alone such tales it meets. When through earth's caverns I awhile have rolled, my waves I rise, and here again behold the long-lost stars, as I late did glide near Styx. Proserpina there I spied. Fear still with grief might in her face be seen. She still her rape laments, yet made a queen. Beneath those gloomy shades her scepter sways, and even the infernal king her will obeys. This heard, the goddess like a statue stood, stupid with grief, and in that musing mood continued long. New cares a while suppressed the reigning of her immortal breast. At last to Jove, her daughter's sire, she flies, and with her chariot cuts the crystal skies. She comes in clouds with disheveled hair, standing before his throne, prefers her prayer. King of the gods, defend my blood and thine, and use it not the worse for being mine. If I no more am gracious in thy sight, be just, O Jove, and do thy daughter right. In vain I sought her the wide world around, and when I most despaired to find her, found. But how can I the fatal finding boast, by which I know she is forever lost, without her father's aid, and what other power can to my arms the ravished maid restore? Let him restore her, all the crime forgive. My child, though ravished, I'd with joy receive. Pity your daughter with a thief should wed, though mine, you think, deserves no better bed. Jove thus replies, It equally belongs to both to guard our common pledge from wrongs, but if to things we proper names apply, this hardly can be called an injury. The theft is love, nor need we blush to own the thief, if I can judge to be our son. Had you of his desert no other proof? To be Jove's brother is, methinks, enough. Nor was my throne by worth superior got. Heaven fell to me as hell to him by lot. If you are still resolved her loss to mourn, and nothing less will serve than her return, upon these terms she may again be yours, the irrevocable terms of fate, not ours. Of Stygian food, if she did not taste, hell's bounds may then and only then be passed. 
the transformation of Ascalaphus into an owl. The goddess, now resolving to succeed, down to the gloomy shades descends with speed, but adverse face had otherwise decreed, for long before her giddy thoughtless child had broke her fast and all her projects spoiled. As in the garden shady walk she strayed, a fair pomegranate charmed the simple maid. Hung in her way and tempting her to taste, she plucked the fruit and took a short repast. Seven times a seed at once, she eat the food. The fact, Ascalaphus had only viewed, whom Asheron begot in Stygian shades, on Orphney famed among Avernal maids. He saw what passed, and by discovering all, detained the ravished nymph in cruel thrall. But now a queen she with resentment heard, and changed the vile informer to a bird. In Phlegaton's black stream her hand she dips, sprinkles his head and wets his babbling lips. Soon on his face, be dropped with magic dew, a change appeared, and gaudy feathers grew, a crooked beak the place of nose supplies, rounder his head and larger are his eyes. His arms and body waste, but are supplied with yellow pinions flagging on each side. His nails grow crooked and are turned to claws, and lazily along his heavy wings he draws. Ill-omened in his form the unlucky fowl, abhorred by men and called a screeching owl. The daughters of Achelis transform to sirens. Justly this punishment was due to him, and less had been too little for his crime. But, O oh, ye nymphs that from the flood descend, what fault of yours the gods could so offend? With wings and claws your beauteous forms to spoil, yet save your maiden face and winning smile. Were you not with her in Pergusa's bowers? When Proserpine went forth to gather flowers, since Pluto in his car the goddess caught, have you not for her in each climate sought? And when on land you long had searched in vain, you wished for wings to cross the pathless main, that earth and sea might witness to your care, that gods were easy and returned your prayer with golden wing or foamy waves you fled, unto the sun your plumy glory spread, but less the soft enchantment of your songs and the sweet music of your flattering tongues should quite be lost as courteous fates ordain your voice and virgin beauty still remain jove for some amends for sarah's loss to make yet willing pluto should the joy partake give them of proserpine an equal share who claim by both and both divides the year the goddess now in either empire sways, six moons in hell and six with Ceres stays. Her peevish tempers changed, that sullen mind which made even hell uneasy now is kind. Her voice refines, her mane more sweet appears, her forehead free from frowns, her eyes from tears. As when with golden light the conquering day through dusky exhalation clears away. Sarah's her daughter's rape no longer mourned, but back to Arethusa's spring returned, and sitting on the margin, bid her tell from when she came, and why a sacred well. The story of Arethusa. Still were the purling waters, and the maid from the smooth surface raised her beauteous head, wipes off the drops that from her tresses ran, and thus to tell Alpheus's loves began. In Ellis first I breathed the living air. The chase was all my pleasure, all my care. None loved me like the forest to explore. To pitch the toils and drive the bristled boar. Of fair though masculine I had the name, but gladly would to have quitted claim. It less my pride than indignation raised to hear the beauty I neglected praised. Such compliments I loathed, such charms as these I scorned, and thought it infamy to please. Once I remember in the summer's heat, tired with the chase, I sought a cool retreat, and walking on, 
a silent current found, which gently glided over the gravelly ground. The crystal water was so smooth, so clear, my eyes distinguished every pebble there, so soft its motion, that I scarce perceived the running stream, or what I saw, believed. The hoary willow and the poplar made along the shelving bank a grateful shade. In the cool rivulet my feet I dipped, then waded to the knee, and then I stripped, my robe I careless on an osier threw, that near the palace commodiously grew, nor long upon the border naked stood, but plunged with speed into the silver flood. My arms a thousand ways I moved, and tried to quicken, if I could, the lazy tide, where, while I played my swimming gambols o'er, I heard a murmuring voice, and fried it sprung to shore. O oh, whither, Arethusa, dost thou fly? From the brook's bottom did Alpheus cry. Again I heard him in a hollow tone. O oh, whither, Arethusa, dost thou run? Naked I flew, nor could I stay to hide. My limbs, my robe was on the other side. Alpheus followed fast the inflaming sight, quickened his speed and made his labor light. He sees me ready for his eager arms, as with a greedy glance devours my charms. As trembling doves from pressing danger fly, when the fierce hawk comes sousing from the sky, and as fierce hawks the trembling doves pursue, from him I fled, and after me he flew. First, by Orochimus, I took my flight, and soon had Sophus and Selene in sight. Behind me then, Hymenelus I lost, and craggy Eromanthus scaled with frost. Ellis was next. Thus far the ground I trod with nimble feet before the distance God. But here I lagged, unable to sustain the labor longer, and my flight maintain, while he more strong, more patient of the toil, and fired with hopes of beauty speedy spoil, gained my lost ground, and by redoubled pace, now left between us but a narrow space, unwearied I still now o'er hills and plains, o'er rocks and rivers ran and felt no pains, the sun behind me and the god I kept, but when I fastest should have run, I stepped. Before my feet his shadow now appeared, as what I saw, or rather what I feared, yet there I could not be deceived by fear, who felt his breath pant on my braided hair, unheard his sounding tread, and knew him to be near, tired and despairing, O oh, celestial maid, I'm caught, I cried without thy heavenly aid, help me, Diana, help a nymph forlorn, devoted to the woods, who long has worn thy livery, and long thy quiver borne. The goddess heard, my pious prayer prevailed. In muffling clouds, my virgin head was veiled. The amorous god, deluded of his hopes, searches the gloom and through the darkness gropes. Twice, where Diana did her servant hide, he came and twice, O oh, Arethusa cried, how shaken was my soul, how sunk my heart. The terror seized on every trembling part. Thus, when the wolf about the mountain prowls, for prey the lambkin hears his horrid howls, the timorous hare, the pack, approaching nigh, thus hearkens to the house and trembles at the cry nor dare she stir for her fear her scented breath directs the dogs and guide the threatened death Alpheus in the cloud no trace is found to mark my way yet stays to guard the ground the god so near a chilly sweat possessed my fainting limbs at every poor expressed. My strength distilled in drops, my hair and dew, my form was changed and all my substance knew. Each motion was a stream, and my whole frame turned to a fount, which still preserves my name. Resolved I should not his embrace escape, again the god resumes his fluid shape to mix his streams with mine. He fondly tries, but still, Diana, his attempt denies. She cleaves the ground, through caverns dark I run, a different current, while he keeps his own. To dear Oritigia she conducts my way, and here I first review the welcome day. Here... Arethusa stopped. Then Sarah's takes her golden car and yokes her fiery snakes with just rain along mid-heaven she flies o'er earth and seas and cuts the yielding skies. She halts at Athens, dropping like a star and to Ptolemus resigns her car. 
parent of seed, she gave him fruitful grain and bade him teach to till and plow the plain, the seed to sow, as well in fallow fields as where the soil manured a richer harvest yields. The transformation of Lincus. The youth o'er Europe and o'er Asia drives till at the court of Lincus he arrives. The tyrant Scythia's barbarous empire swayed, and when he saw Triptolemus, he said, How camest thou, stranger, to our court, and why? Thy country and thy name? The youth did thus reply, Triptolemus my name, my country's known o'er all the world. Minerva's favorite town, Athens, the first of cities in renown. By land I neither walked nor sailed by sea, but hither through the ether made my way. By me the goddess who fields the bee friends, these gifts the greatest of all blessings sends. The grain she gives, if in your soil you sow, thence wholesome food in golden crops will grow. Soon as the secret to the king was known, he grudged the glory of the service done, and wickedly resolved to make it all his own. To hide his purpose, he invites his guest, the friend of Sarah's, to a royal feast. And when sweet sleep his heavy eyes had seized, the tyrant with his steel attempts his breast. Him straight a lynx shape the goddess gives, and home the youth her sacred dragons drives. The purities transformed into magpies. The chosen muse here ends her sacred lays. The nymphs unanimous decree the bays and give the Heliconian goddesses the praise. Then, far from vain that we should thus prevail, but much provoked to hear the vanquished rail, Callio presumes, too long we've borne your daring taunts and your affronting scorn. Your challenge justly merited a curse, and this unmannered railing makes it worse. Since you refuse us calmly to enjoy our patience, next our passions will employ, the dictates of a mind in rage pursue, and what our just resentment bids us do. The railers laughed, our threats in wrath despise, and clap their hands and make a scolding noise. But in fact, they're seized beneath their nails, feathers they feel, and on their faces, scales. Their horny beaks at once each other scare, their arms are plumed, and on their backs they bear pied wings and flutter in the fleeting air. Chattering, the scandal of the woods they fly, and there continue still their clamorous cry. The same their eloquence as maids or birds, now only noise, nothing then but words.